but great following them and great just getting that sort of uh, little story if you want this morning. We're just coming up to Gary Wartel and we spotted something in the distance so I'm going to try and get in on this side. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can see, oh beautiful guys, look at this, look at this, look at this. Truly one of the most stunning birds that we see out here. Massive birds as well, they probably one meter forty or something like that, head to toe. In other words, they would be almost shoulder height for a sort of medium sized human. Oh, look at that. Big wings, beautiful birds when they're flying. We saw one this morning flying when we were driving around. Always looks a little bit prehistoric when you see massive birds like this in flight. This, of course, is a stork more specifically called a saddle bill stalk. And again, to be more specific again, this is a male and a female. I have a close look. This is a bit like, you know, spot the difference. I know the one bird is hiding behind the other one at the moment, but I don't want to move because they've actually stayed. They didn't fly away, so we've got a great view. So we'll just wait a bit. As soon as they move slightly, then we can see them more separate from each other. Have a close look and see if you can see any differences between the two of them. In fact, you might even see it already. Keep a close eye on it. Perhaps you notice something. Both birds have got the beautiful coloration on the bodies, the what you call aposematic coloration, sort of very vivid black and white markings, very stark markings. Bit of red on the legs, obviously the beak where the name derives from, saddle bull stalk. But you can actually see the difference between male and female quite easily. I'm sure maybe one or two of you have chatted about it in on the Twitter feeds or the chat. Which reminds me, if you haven't been on many drives with us before, you're welcome to ask questions or if you've maybe seen the difference and you know which one is the male and which one is the female and you want to let us know, you can use the hashtag Safari Live for a tweet or an email as well, questions at Wild Earth, but the tweet is sort of where the conversations is happening. Grooming is a very important part of, of daily routine for any animal. Us as well, humans, it's important to keep ourselves clean, important for health, other different reasons as well. And animals, especially birds, spend a lot of time grooming and preening the feathers, making sure everything exactly where it should be. You know, it's a bit like your sort of pre-flight checks before you fly from Europe to Africa or America to Africa or something. You want to make sure that you know, everything that needs to move and open and close when you're flying is working. You don't want to be halfway across the ocean and then realize, oh, I forgot to check that thing. And the same with birds. They want to make sure their feathers are in tip-top condition, neat and healthy because that's important for the flight. They even oil or they even groom the feathers as well. And, and, and oil is maybe the easiest way to explain it. They've got what's called a preening gland. Most birds, you'll see it when, they, when they're busy grooming themselves. Every now and again, just putting their beak sort of on the back between the shoulder blades or between the wing blades so to speak and they get a little bit of a like an oily substance from there that they use I think you might have noticed what I'm mentioning by now the bird on the left which would be the female he's got the yellow around the eye I think we're close enough to see that we will try and get closer but they might fly I think we've just had some good feedback regarding the same point as well for those of you that spotted it thank you for letting us know <laughs> it's a fork tail drongo, Montengo in Shangdan, one of my favorite birds out here. Great characters, I mean they take on everything from eagles to snakes to mongoose and, and so on. And uh, just telling the stork there that they're in the way, telling them, get out of the way, get away from my place.
us. Thank you for giving us feedback there. Renee, Simon, and Rosie, you guys spotted the eye difference or the difference in the eyes. Let's just get a bit closer again. They're normally a little bit shy birds, so you can't get too close to them. And they're obviously catching all kinds of things, storks. And these guys are around water areas often, so they will be catching little fish and frogs and things like that. But they'll also catch insects. I mean, anything really that makes for a good meal. And obviously, just judging by those legs, they can walk quite deep into the water without having to worry too much about if they need to swim or not. So they, they hunt in everything from the edge of the water to about sort of two feet, two and a half feet deep water. Lovely setting. Gary Woodall from a different view. I think, actually we might as well just continue around the edge here. As we heard from the water camera, lots of elephant activity last night. You can see just looking at the texture around the edge here, lots of sort of flattened sand, ellies and all kinds of other animals that come and drink. Have a quick look at this heron as well, just while we've got such beautiful light on him. Oh, he's going to fly away a little bit. Stalk's still walking around. I'm going to try and go around them. Maybe we should just we'll go up the side here, we'll go up the right hand edge. Also notice there, George Ann, if I'm getting the name right, that the male has a bit of a wattle under his beak. Well spotted. We're gonna leave the stalks to stalk around some more. And I wanna go check the little wattle on the other side as well. There's another small wattle to the other camp and quite often elephants like to drink there because it's a the water that gets pumped water as well so it's nice clean water we'll have a look there and then i think we'll be heading down towards three hours dam we'll look around a bit see if we don't find any signs from kunyuma the young male leopard that's been hanging around that area let's see what we can find this morning or what else we can find this morning leopard tracks here. Mahinas had walked here last night, one Ahina at least. Just left Gauri Water Hall, we're now going to go around to see if there's some activity maybe at the little water hall, the drinking hall in front of Galago Camp, which is the other camp. They've got two lodges here in Juma. The Boitella Lodge, which is sitting on the bigger water hall of Gauri, or Gauri Water Hall. The Boitella Water Hall, or Juma Dam, there's a, sort of a few different names we use for it. Juma Dam. And there's a pan in front of the other camp, which is called Galago, which is named after a beautiful little animal called the Bush Baby. Bush babies look a little bit like Ewoks. If you know what an Ewok looks like, it's an Ewok. I was going to say it looks like a gremlin, except not, not at all. Small furry bear. Small furry bear. Hey, I'm actually going to stop for this one. 
Guys, we, um, as you all know, what Wild Earth has always done and always will do is giving you a perfectly realistic, live, immersive experience into the bush. We're sharing this. I'm not going on game drive with a camera. You're not going on game drive with some strange random person talking to you. That's the great thing about this is we really get to share experiences. We really get to share friendships in many cases. And we certainly get to share the mutual moment experience of being in the bush. And that's brilliant. For me, this is personally hugely exciting. I've always been a big fan of it. But one of the things in the bush that we have done and that we're going to do more of again, and I'm just as excited about it as you, is to get out on foot. Now, when you're driving along and you get a track and you have a quick look and you come back to the car, that's one thing, and it's also interesting. As soon as you step onto the ground, as soon as you touch the earth with your feet, there is a little bit of a heightening of senses again. But to walk around in the bush, to go for 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour of walking in the bush, tracking things, trying to find some of these big animals we so enjoy seeing, is not only hugely exciting, but it's also a very special experience. It's a very visceral, a very intimate, a very sensitive experience to the environment. Your adrenaline goes up a little bit, your senses heighten, you hear better, you see better, you smell better, and, um, and you also understand better. You get to touch things and look at things that you might not have noticed from a vehicle, just because of the, not only the physical, but also the mental space you're in. So walking is very, very exciting. And um, I've always loved it. Many of you that have been on safaris have loved it, I know. And um, Scott, I know, is a big fan of being on foot as well. He's on camera, and it's a very special way of doing camera. Um, Herman can certainly attest to that. And, uh, and Stefan, who I only met a few days ago, a week ago when we came out here, is a hugely knowledgeable guy, a hell of a nice guy as well. Sorry, I, I meant to say a heck of a nice guy. <laughs> that slipped out. Uh, but a really, really nice guy with phenomenal knowledge. Uh, Stefan has got knowledge that uh, many, many guides can only dream about. You know, he's forgotten things that people are still learning. But not only that, he's got a great sensitivity to the environment. I've had many talks with him now, and, and apart from being a very nice guy, you meet people and you, and you know that they've got an understanding as well of the environment beyond just uh, things that you've learned. You know, it's, it's uh, oh yeah, he says said, the American, um, uh, Native American said that it, uh, you get a sensitivity to nature if you, if you live close to it. So um, Stefan is going to show us more of what's going on on foot. So I just want to hear that again. I've just got a bit of information there. So maybe I did that a bit long, but it's really a fascinating and great experience to be on foot. And we're going to be joining Stefan very, very shortly. Let's just make sure when the right moment is. Well, hello, and welcome to the Sunrise Bushwalk with myself, Stefan, and Scott behind the camera. And we've run, literally run into this area. We were busy following up uh, in the area for some predator sign. And while we were, were sitting there in the bush, we were listening to Kudu's alarm calling and Impala giving alarm calls. And Scott and I literally just as fast as we could made it into this area. When we got here though, the Impala and the Kudu had stopped calling. And so now what we're doing is we're sitting and we're waiting to see if we can, if we can hear anything else. So far, we've got some squirrel calling on our right hand side. We've got some Impala calling on our left hand side, but it doesn't sound frantic enough. So Scott and I decided that we'd show you something that we found over here around the, uh, around the pan, which is quite interesting. While we wait for the bush to tell us what's going on, we thought that we'd show you. It's a little plant that grows on disturbed areas. And as you can see from where we're sitting at the moment, it looks like a big mud puddle and that's exactly what it is. It's a wallow and this particular plant likes to grow around wallows. It, it, it enjoys areas of disturbed soils. But it's got quite an interesting use. The local people strip the leaves and they use it for a variety of different things but the, 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 the most interesting thing that they use it for is a type of soap. Now, in this wallow, I've got some water that's left over, as you can see, quite muddy and disgusting. And I'm mixing some of this water with this plant. And while I'm doing it, as you can see, it's becoming increasingly more slimy. Have a look at that. That's just all the soap. It's called saponins. 
and it's coming out of this plant. There's quite a few plants actually that have saponins, but this is the only one that I know of that grows in this particular area. Now, you can wash your clothes with this. You can also wash your hands. They make for actually quite a lovely hand wash. And it washes off quite easily as well. So once you've finished, you clean your hands. Well, as much as what you can anyway. And then you carry on. Now what I wanted to show you was where it gets another name for itself from. And I dug around on it, and this interesting thorn, as you can see, you've got two horns, and it's called a sheep's, a sheep's thorn, or a devil's thorn. And this is exactly made for stepping for the, the, the seed itself is actually made to be picked up by animals with cloven hooves. They step on it, it sticks to their hoof, and they walk. As you can see, it's quite uh, aerodynamic, for lack of a better word. And then they scrape it off, and that's how the seed goes from place to place. So quite nice, eh? Now, we have been hearing a lot of alarm calls around. We're going to be following up on these alarm calls. It sounds quite frantic at the moment. I'm glad that we stood by here. Quickly, I'm going to wipe off my hands. I'll just go again with your last message. So we've just done a complete circuit of that, a circuit of that area uh, up around where the lines were and exactly what Pete said, the tracks go over into uh, Buffalo Sook, which is the property, the reserve next to us here. Um, so they may come back in, we'll keep our ears open during the night, that's for sure, and there's a lot of people uh, that uh, have intelligence that can tell us what's going on. I'm just going to see what that is on the road up there right off in the distance. Uh, Andrew, you might see just standing on the road. It might just be Impala, but it's always good to have a look. Could be maybe a kudu? It's a kudu, that's exactly what it is. So a couple of kudu crossing over. We might just go down there and have a little look at them. One of my favorite antelope, <coughs> kudu. So off in the distance, your naked eye as a human being uh, has a tendency to play tricks on you sometimes. <laughs> you want it to be, you think, oh, is that a lion or is that a leopard or whatever. Uh, but a lot of the time it's antelope and a lot of the time they're as important as as beautiful to go and have a look at. Expected there are going to be a few little challenges along the way with doing all these things we're doing. There's some nice fresh inner tracks on the road, guys. But um, just to get back to that walk, I guarantee you, over the next while, as the walk becomes more of 
uh, more a part of this experience. You're going to love it. There is just something different about being on foot, just the way your senses and your, your whole being react to your surroundings. But we will get back to Stefan and, and Scott out there again. For the moment, we are... Let's check. Always, whenever you get onto a new road, it's always good to just give a quick check. You know, are there any fresh tracks? We are slowly heading still in the direction of Triaz Dam. I'm going to go look around there for, well, for anything really, but I'm still having a hope for a new mother this morning. It's been two days now, I'm going to get withdrawals if I don't see him. My favorite young leopard in this area. And of course, anything else, because anything can happen when you're live in the bush. You never know what's around the next bend. Tracking is a very interesting thing in so many respects. Catherine, you're just asking how would you track an animal on hard sort of clay soils? Um, let me just try and think which, which angle to start that question from. Sorry, Catherine, I'm just looking as well because there's um, no leopard tracks, but there's a couple of tracks around just to keep in mind. I was heard of Impala coming up here on the left. We'll have a couple of minutes with them. But tracking, obviously, the footprints itself. That's, that's the first key component of tracking. Hence, it's called tracking. It's the actual tracks. But then, um, so a little bit closer to them. Morning, guys. That's a beautiful setting. Lovely herd of impala. So if you are following something, like let's say busy tracking a, a leopard for this, for, for this instance, and it is walking along sandy soils, and you can follow it, and you can get the signs, the physical tracks, maybe where it's scent marked, maybe where it's scratched a little bit in the soil for, for marking as well. And you get an idea of what the animal is actually up to. In other words, this leopard is busy hunting. From the way it moves, you can see it's using cover. Or this leopard is busy patrolling his boundaries in the case of a dominant male. And you know that again because of the scent marks and things. All those things you use to build an idea of what is the animal up to, what is he doing, where is he going. Also, if you, if you work in an area you live there for a while you get to, to know certain animals certain trends and patterns they have the same as us you can you can predict some of it from that so you use all those things so if you're following a track and it gets to hard clay soil you wouldn't necessarily follow the tracks across it but you would get an idea of all this leopard is heading that way so i'll go check that side again and see where the tracks come out and at the same time for someone that's learning to track you need a nice big track in sand so you can see what animal it is but the better you get at tracking, you might just see on the clay soil just a little smudge where this clay is slightly different color from the rest or where a, a leaf got squashed into the clay and it hasn't popped out again. Just little, little signs that might give you indications. Well, so there really is, as I said, um, I think earlier this morning, there's a, there's a certain amount of logic to it, the basic building blocks of tracking. Then there is certainly a massive amount of art to it. In other words, once you become someone that that, that spends time at it and works at it and practices it, you will get better at it. And then there is an element of just sheer magic with it as well. You just get people that have an understanding of something. The same as, you know, let's compare it to cooking. Anyone can do the basics of cooking and then you can perfect it into an art, but then you get the artists that just have that little feeling, just that flair, adding that little bit of a herb or that extra half a slice of tomato and that makes a difference between a, a, a a very good dish and a great dish and the same with tracking in the combination of all those things there's the male impala we saw him yesterday he's following the females around i think we're going to leave them they're walking away a little bit still have that hazy sort of horizon skyline there towards the east a bit of wind as well it's feeling a bit more wintry today than it has since we've been here Let's get that sort of wintry wind not cold but still cool enough to have a jacket on so 
also means animals can still be active. Animals that might have been summertime settled down now already. Lions, if they were busy hunting, or uh, leopard, or wild dogs that were busy running around. The animals that would say, well, it's getting hot now, I'm going to slow down, find a place to rest for the day. They might still be active a little bit later in the day because it is nice and cool. tracks well, we're going to continue on and uh, animals we haven't seen a lot of, you will be seeing them with Hayden. Enjoy it, I'll see you back here this time. Well folks, we just pulled up here and two of my favorite animals, well, one of my favorite animal, one of them is a zebra, a uh, virtual zebra. I just happens to be two here, that's what I was meaning. Um, oh goodness me, I haven't seen them here for all, all week. Uh, the numbers have definitely changed compared to when we were here uh, in November. And a lot of the reasons for that is that the grasses are changing and uh, they're moving on. But uh, we've got two individuals here, beautiful, beautiful creatures, amazing uh, design and I often stop at the simple things folks just because uh, when you do see a lot of the one animal impala or or uh, zebra or anything else buffalo for that matter we have a tendency as human beings to give that cursory glance and I always use that term cursory glance because it's like no oh, another zebra another impala but you know what sometimes it's just great to stop and just if they're also grazing comfortably uh, what a lovely lovely time it is to see you can see that magnificent pattern the most standout feature of the zebra which uh, scientists have got many many different theories of why this occurs but uh, one of the theories is just that when they are in that big herd situation they uh, a lot of animals running with those stripes on them makes it more difficult for predators to figure out but oh, I don't know I think it's still a bit camouflaged because you really do dis they disappear into the into the woodland uh, very quickly and very easily when you're on foot walking uh, you can see zebra well they see you before you see them normally but they really do blend in even though they look they look, might look striking as they are right now uh, it's very very easy to lose them So they're much more active during the day than they are at the night. Uh, <coughs> just got an aircraft leaving one of the lodges, folks. That's probably what you can hear in the background. If you've got any questions, please feel free to send through uh, those questions via Twitter. You can tweet us at hashtag Safari Live, or you can send questions through to us on email at questions at Wild Earth. Sorry, let's start that again questions at wildearth.tv uh, that'll be the, the way to email us be lovely to hear from you if you've got any questions Often see uh, zebra. The difference between them at day and night, and you really do see it when you drive through somewhere at night. They spend much more time uh, in open sort of pasture land during the night to just to make sure that they stay a bit safer. Moving a lot more during the day when they've got their their greatest sense uh, available to them. That's their sense of sight combined with hearing during the day. But at night, it's mainly just hearing and sense of smell.
they often uh, just lie down and they can just lie down and lie flat on the ground asleep resting resting but they normally have a uh, a pair of eyes standing watching like a sentry It's lovely to sit with them and watch them graze. They're not moving on too fast, which is great. That's why I'm sitting here, folks, and it's just just lovely to watch them. Often We don't often see zebra at this time of the year, so um, a real, real treat this morning. Very special creature. Has to be one of the most incredible patterns of... Uh, all the hoofed animals, <coughs> giraffe and zebra pretty are up the top there for um, extraordinary markings. The real characteristic tail swishing there, really annoying flies on their rump. Always keeping alert. When I was working in a zoo, uh, I looked after zebras for a very long time and uh, they're great creatures, really great. I had the privilege of seeing a foal born, uh, which was quite an experience. And they are pretty much ready to rock and roll, ready to run, uh, not soon after they're born, after about a couple of an hour or so. They're on their feet and they're ready to go. I'll roll down for you, Andrew, in a second. I just want to see that uh, <coughs> we don't startle this one because I don't want them to run off. <coughs> Excuse me, please. It's okay, my boy. It's okay, it's okay. Just wanted to move forward a little bit to get you a better picture. Uh, but it looks like he's coming back over onto Juma, which is interesting. So we might have a little bit more time. Ah, oh, yes, the quintessential moment is about to happen, folks. There it is. I won't say it. I'll let you just think it. So Helen, uh, welcome aboard, great to have you with us. Um, you've just tweeted us uh, a, a question about whether either of these individuals have a, uh, uh, a, a wound on their left uh, rump, and the answer to that's no. Um, I know that you, there was an instance uh, uh, recently where Brent saw uh, an individual with a, a nice big 
slice down their their rump, and that is unfortunately uh, definite or more than definitely a uh, a line. Where as the line goes to grab that that tail end or that back end, that those hind quarters with its claws, sometimes the animal will kick out, maybe injure the line, but the the line will still make contact, and those razor sharp line claws will. Uh, leave a nasty wound. <clears throat> I've seen it on many a zebra. Um, the old sort of war horses that we have, I'll just let this uh, this individual pass before I start the vehicle so they, they get uh, comfortable with each other. We don't want to split them off. And they're beautiful creatures. And this plains or, or birch or zebra has uh, has that shadow stripe and you'll see that up here whereas there's other species there's the Grevy zebra there's the Hartman's mountain zebra in, uh, in Namibia but you this one they don't have a shadow stripe whereas these guys have this shadow stripe you see that it's urinating there on a the same spot just a little territorial marking there so they could be waiting for some females to come through. You'll get that uh, that shadow stripe on the animal, and that's the, the little sort of paler stripe in between the the darker ones, which is a great indicator that it's Burchell zebra. I'm just rolling down here, and I'll get you into a nice position, Andrew. I was hoping not to have to stop. Lovely shot. <clears throat> Very spectacular creatures. Got a question from Elizabeth in Minnesota. Hi, Elizabeth. Welcome aboard, and great to have you with us. Um, Elizabeth's asking about that sort of twitching that you see, that sort of spasmodic twitching that the animals use. Uh, and look, she's, uh, you're asking that it looks a little bit painful. It's far from it, Elizabeth. I assure you, it's um, it's a mechanism that they have that they use to uh, get rid of flies on their body. Um, huge, very muscular animals. Uh, and that will be a mechanism that they use just to uh, try and get away those pesky flies. But these are two beautiful, beautiful stallions. Not, not, I think, I'm sorry, let me just double check. I think one's a stallion. I'm just checking out to see the other one now. <coughs> I kind of couldn't quite see that. I'm sorry, one's a stallion. I do apologise. A few war wounds on this boy as well here that we've got in our, our vision on the left facing us. <coughs> I don't know, they might be bachelors. I'm just trying to make out the other... The males have got... Young males look similar to to the females, but uh, the, the, when they become proper stallions, you can see when, when they're right next to each other, they're quite, uh, quite chunky compared to the females. This may be actually the female, I, I do apologise. We just go over, pan over to that other one, Andrew. It's uh, some lovely, lovely oxpeckers have just landed on it. <coughs> I'll just move down a little bit.
Those lovely ox peckers there, doing what they do best, <coughs> holding onto that that hair and with those modified, really, really sharp little claws, um, and sort of just mousing their way, like they just they creep along like a little little mouse along the uh, animal, and they really do get any parasites or pesky blood-sucking uh, parasitic infestations. So it's actually a, a stallion and a mare. Uh, she looks like she's heavy in foal actually, uh, that one that we just had. But uh, apologies about that, I just couldn't quite see from the angle I was on. So we've seen some beautiful zebra, which is a great one. I haven't seen zebra all week. But for the minute, we'll sit with them, watch where they go. And if they move off into the bush, we're just going to carry on and cut back in. We're going to cut over to the guys on the bushwalk. So uh, we'll see you just now. I'm sure they've got something fantastic. Well, welcome back to the bushwalk with Scott and myself. And what a lovely surprise. We bumped into some buffalo here. Now, Scott and I have been following up on alarm calls of kudu and impala for the entire morning. About 45 minutes ago, we heard alarm calls of kudu in this area. And we made our way into this area to see if we could come and find what was disturbing them. They've gone silent. And just as we were busy combing through the area, we bumped into these buffalo now. It's for precisely these moments that I carry a rifle, as you'll notice. We're far away from vehicles and we're far away from a lodge. And this is essentially just a piece of safety equipment, very similar to a safety belt or a car's airbag. And, you know, while we hope we never use it, um, I, for one, am quite happy to have it. Uh, so they big these guys, you know. <laughs> they don't seem to be too worried about us, but like with like with all dangerous animals, like with all dangerous animals, you want to kind of try and maintain a healthy distance from them. They watching us, we watching them, but we're definitely not going to be going any closer. In fact, Scott and I are going to be making our way away from these buffalo. Where the source of these kudu calls and alarm calls came from us, we, uh, we, we think we heard these kudu calls. So we're going to be walking into the bush very carefully and we're going to be keeping our eyes on our back trail making sure that these guys can't get us all right let's carry on So myself and Scott have come into this area. We're trying to make our way away from the buffalo, perpendicular away from them. And this is very, very close to where we heard those kudu giving alarm calls a bit earlier this morning. Now, while we're on foot, as it's quite thick in here, we were also on foot. And because we didn't have the disturbance of the car engine, we were able to hear these kudu giving alarm calls. And isn't it wonderful that you can join us on foot while we come and look for the cause? So, we're going to be quite careful. I want to check wind direction the whole time. I'm using my trusty Scott sock for that. It's blowing directly into our faces, which is a good thing. Let's snoop around a bit.
Now I'm being quite wary, keeping my eyes scanned. It's important. It's important to scan and to listen. The bush is telling us all the time that things are happening around here. They've told us that there's a predator here via Kudu's giving a bark. You never can tell what you're going to find. Okay, I've got what looks to be a kill here. As you can see, we've definitely got a dead animal there. Mm. I'm just going to have a look with my binoculars. It's a good Can you believe it? Now, the things that kill Kudu. Lion kill kudu, leopard can kill kudu. I don't see any lions here. I mean, they didn't. I didn't hear anything. They're not growling at us. I think what we're gonna do is just make sure there aren't any lions lying here in the shade, and then we're gonna back out and we're gonna call Peter or Hayden. We're gonna call one of them here, and he'll take you closer in the vehicle. But myself and Scott, I'm just gonna make a quick recce here, just to make sure that it's an attended carcass this time of year this time of the year animals do die of disease and we just want to make sure that it's not an animal that's died of a disease So we're just making sure that this kudu hasn't died of natural causes, which is why we are walking around it at the moment. This time of year, drought conditions, kudu and impala do definitely, they definitely like dying from natural causes, dry times, disease, anything like that. I don't want to approach the carcass too closely in case there is a catcher. Yeah? Doesn't look like there's any anything here, although, let me have a, I've got growling to my right, okay, so, folks, I've just heard some growling coming from that bush over there now, that's a clear indication to me that there's a predator around here, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be slowly backing out, and we're going to be calling in a vehicle. So this could you definitely didn't die of natural causes. We've definitely got a predator here, guys. So, wow. So, we've now made our way out. Peter or Hayden come in. Hey Peter, if you copy me, we've got uh, what looks to be a kudu kill with, uh, I didn't see it, we didn't see it, but we definitely got grass. Probably 200, 250 meters into the bush from Philemon's exciting for us. Got the call a bit earlier saying that uh, there might be some exciting news Stefan and Scott are tracking and knowing what you guys know now I'm very excited as well. We are very close to there. We we're just waiting to get the final confirmation for them if they did get a visual or not which again you've seen before us. So I'm uh, 
looking forward to getting a look myself now. Stefan should be somewhere in this vicinity. Ah, there we go. Just look down that way, guys. There you can see. All right. There's Stefan. We've got him. I must admit, I'm very excited to see Stefan and Scott. And also about what you're going to see, what they found for us there. That's really awesome. Really in the end. Getting on foot and tracking things down. There's a great adventure aspect to it. Also one of the best, best, best ways to find these animals. So that's amazing. Also great to have the first live experience of this shared experience. The kudu, yeah, but we, we're just walking around to make sure she didn't die of natural causes or anything. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, okay, so we, so you found the carcass in here. Yeah, we didn't see anything, but definitely that bush is angrier than is right. it? So it's, not, it's not just the bush, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's big leopard. Something's there, yeah. Don't know, didn't get it's visual, not a leopard so. tortoise, perhaps. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing, yeah. So we're going to head out, uh, maybe to so we don't disturb it. Good luck. Hope you enjoy. Awesome. Let us know what you find. And you don't know, you know, I'm just being able to run faster than the slowest yeah. person. I mean, I've seen Scott run it fast, but he's carrying lots of gear there. Scott, awesome, there's the first thing to start this. It's a million, eh? Cool. Guys, that's so exciting, though. Sure, sure, sure. Just grab this. Sorry, I'm just trying to plug myself in so I can hear the needed information. Maybe you couldn't hear quite everything we were saying there because um, we are speaking quite softly. Just to say again, if you couldn't follow, Scott and, um, and uh, Stefan came in here, heard some calls, alarm calls, found the area for it, and then didn't see the leopard but heard it. And I'm going to try and see just now. Tre uh, I don't know why I want to keep saying Trevor this morning for Stefan. It reminds me of a guy called Trevor that did that as well. But um, Stefan's saying that they saw the, the carcass and it looks like a kudu carcass. They had a look just to make sure it's not maybe a random sort of coincidence. Um, and they didn't see the leopard now, but they could hear, as we were joking, is they could hear a bush that seems to be speaking leopard. So we're going to look around here. Oh, you know, that being on foot is just great. I mean, just being part of this, I mean, I'm in the vehicle. But for myself, I can feel my adrenaline going up a little bit. So you can imagine the guys, as they're tracking into that fresh track, where you've got a smell, something that tells you you're right close to it now. Always amazing. Let's see what we can find, guys. Scrubby bush around here. Carefully. Oh, there's the carcass. There's the first part of the story. Well, of the hunt story. The first part of the story was Stefan and them finding this. So many levels. <laughs> I think what happened is, um, as Stefan and they were coming in, following up on the sort of bits of information they received from. Oh, look at that! Yo, 
yo, yo, yo, yo. Amazing how these guys have been there. Just look there. Incredible, the camouflage, huh? And keep in mind, we had a very strong suspicion whereabouts to look for this leopard. Just to sort of bring you in on the story, if you've maybe just joined us, we'll show you again just now. On the left-hand side, there's quite a large kudu. I'm very impressed. A big kill for this leopard. Let me show you that. And the guys are coming in here to follow up on the sort of the bush information they received, the sounds and the tracks and the things all put together. Obviously coming in on foot, the leopard would have seen them. They're very aware as well. He would have just moved off, as we can see now. He moved off about 30 yards and left this carcass here. But this is amazing. This is a massive, massive prey for any leopard. Even a mature male of five, six years would still uh, be... I mean, that's a, a young but adult female kudu. That's probably, I'm going to estimate it at about a, uh, 120 kilograms at least twice, if not more than twice, the weight of the leopard. He's had a good meal already. He's gotten into the intestines. He would have eaten some of the, the good bits, liver maybe, some of the big sort of chunky meat areas around the hindquarters. So he's already had a good meal. Let's go closer to him, see if we can confirm which leopard this is. But that is a very impressive kill for any leopard. Never mind one of the young males. Hey, you beautiful thing. I was hoping to find Kanuma in this area. But this is quarantine. I think. Let's just make sure. Yes. As also for you that know this leopard well, help us with the ID there to confirm it for us. We use the whisker spots, the facial markings. But after a while, you get to know them even just on sort of how they look, you know, just the facial shape and so forth. But this looks like quarantine to me. One of the two young males, and just to stress the fact again, I know there's been sort of comments about these, these young guys catching smaller prey. That's typically what young leopards do. They catch whatever they can, really, in the beginning while they're still gaining experience. They are independent of their mother now, even though he is still staying in her area. So they still have the protection to an extent of staying in her area and... and uh, and if the big dominant male came through here, which is Mvula, which is their father, they should have a bit of a break from him. But very, very soon they will be totally independent. They will be pushed off. And just heartening to know that this guy, two and a half years old almost, is capable of kidding, killing a, a kudu cow that is at least twice, maybe even approaching three times his own weight. So, well done, full belly. Too big to take up into a tree. So. The next challenge would be to try and keep this food because hyenas, lions, other leopard, even wild dogs potentially, all animals that could steal that food from him. But that's very impressive. And how exciting to not only be looking at a leopard, but to have found this through the teamwork, the different guys out here, and more specifically through the skill and experience and steady nerves of the guys that are out on foot, Stefan and Scott. And I know from your side as well, guys, this is very exciting that we're going to be getting you into the bush on foot more often as well. It just gives you a deeper appreciation, deeper understanding of the bush, just by being able to look at the tracks and look at the thorns on the thorn bush or the leaves on the tree and how it works or the berries on the bush when it's fruiting. All those little things just give you a deeper understanding of nature and of the, the environment around you. But ultimately, being on foot is also usually exciting because you might track yourself into a leopard on a kill or a herd of elephant, or a couple of buff just taking it easy in the shade. And that's all the, the exciting, that venture, the, the rush aspect of the walk, combined with a very sensitive of, uh, ability to, to learn about all the small things as well. So being on foot truly is a lovely experience. And I'm very excited that this is coming back into the, into the experience for everyone. So on all levels, an exciting morning for us. Maneuver, maneuver a little bit. I was going to say maneuver a little bit. That would be maneuver and move in one word. So let's maneuver a little bit. Quarantine seems happy in the shade there. He's got lots of food just there. Too big for him to move. That's the one problem. That would be too difficult for him to put up in a tree. But it's just maybe we can get a slightly better look at him while he's having a nap. What a beautiful cat. After last year, myself, which is my wife, we were referring to them as Brad and Orlando. Quarantine reminding us a little bit of Brad, but he's got that classic 
Yeah. Square jaw, great eyes. Whereas Kunyuma is a little bit more sort of prettier. Kunyuma could be in the area as well. In fact, this would be fascinating. I was saying earlier you could have things like a hina, wild dog, lion potentially arriving and taking this food from him. But there's actually as good a chance, if not a better chance, that his brother might show up here. And that would be very interesting to see. They are now independent of each other. They don't hang around together anymore. But they obviously know each other while they grew up together. So it would be very interesting to see if Kunyuma was to show up here. Would they share the kill, considering that it's such a large kill? So who knows? Maybe this morning still? I would definitely not miss, miss the sunset safari. Because we have a leopard story happening. <laughs> Guys, thanks for the confirmations there of this ID. You guys agreeing that it is quarantine. George Ann is commenting there as well that this is the first time that you've actually heard quarantine growl. It's very important that we realize animals, or wild animals, react very differently to people on foot as opposed to us in the vehicles. With the vehicles, they get used to the shape of the vehicle, the presence of the vehicle, and they don't associate that necessarily with the traditional primal human being on foot. Keep in mind, for many millions of years and for thousands of years, we've been competing with each other in some way or another. So innately, predators, or all animals, but even predators are afraid of humans, or wary of them at least. Around here, they get used to it. He's not upset, you can see he's totally relaxed. Stefan and them walking into this area wouldn't have had any difference to his behavior, other than that he growled and ran away a little bit, but he's not going to be upset about it the rest of the day. And it's also important to know that it's normal for different species to interact. If Aina had walked in here, they might have tried to steal that food. If lions had walked in here, they would have tried to kill this leopard. So people walking in on a sighting like this is just a great experience for all of us and something that really is not a problem or a threat in any way to this leopard. But it doesn't mean that he's not going to react. Oh, this is awesome. On so many levels. Look at that coat, even just lying in the wide open in front of us. It's still amazing how they blend in. If we just look at sort of the, the wider view, obviously it is getting brighter now. We've got um, the sun getting harsher, so your contrast are much harsher. You can see the sunlight outside very bright. Just look at that. Keep in mind, we are at the moment, uh, I'd say about six meters, let's call it 20 feet, if that, away from this leopard. And you could so easily walk right past this. If you didn't hear the little growl from the leopard or smelled the carcass or heard the squirrels calling or found the tracks, if you were just walking randomly through the bush, you could just walk past this without even knowing about him. They are truly one of the masters of camouflage leopard. in behavior, in how they do things, and how they move, and how they approach the environment. And obviously that coat, that dappled markings or the rosettes we get on them. And they didn't, this leopard didn't decide to put that on this morning. Leopards don't change their spots as you know, but it certainly took a long time to evolve into this perfect camouflaged coat. Oh, look at him. Beautiful.
Ah. This is beyond awesome. I've just said now that on so many levels this is very special. Very excited that we're bringing the walk into the experience again for you on all levels from the small things, the tracks, the flowers, the trees, all those little things you can learn. But also the excitement of it, the fact that you can actually find a leopard or an elephant on foot. And then to share that with the vehicles and bringing it all together, you know, it's getting closer and closer all the time to all the different experiences you can have on a, on a safari. And that's what we're doing. So, fantastic. Also to see this leopard, I know this is a particularly special leopard for many of us. Quarantine in Kuyuma, the boys of Karula, which is a leopard that I have long history with and have a lot of time for. And then the fact that it's happening right now that we're sharing it is something that no matter how many times I've done it, for me this just is beyond cool. So I have to say a special good morning and uh, so nice to have you in the vehicle. As I know you are very often scuttable. My wife Lishna is on drive as well at the moment. She's got a special place for these leopard and for Karula. She knew them well back then. So um, nice to have in the vehicle. Very nice. Glad you're enjoying it with us. Oh, look at those eyes. Amazing. Hello, Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie is just wondering how close Stefan and Scott were when they found the queue. Now, I'm not exactly sure how close they were, but I do know that they had a good look at that carcass. And I don't think he's moved much further than where he is now. And, and Stefan also said to me that he heard the bush growl. <laughs> I love the way Stefan describes things. He's got a great understanding, well above... Um, average in terms of how the bush works and, and also has a great way of interpreting it and explaining it and he was saying he heard the bush growl from us to the kudu or to the carcass and just have another look 30 meters if that we can show you quickly this is the tree that would have been growling and there's the carcass Brian's just going to show you around that side so I'd say about 30 meters that's about 30 yards close to the same distance and that's where they would have been at some stage when they heard the growling bush. And he also, keep in mind, he was just letting them know that, listen, I'm over here, I don't want to confront you unnecessarily. And that works well, so good communication both ways. Oh, look at that face. Just look at that face. Well, uh, sort of linked together there, Rina is just asking, hello, asking um, if we're close to where those ahina were early. We were following some ahina earlier, and we thought they were maybe, in fact, I even speculated on the fact that it might be Q's kill, because that's where we last saw him two days ago. But, you know, we're a bit further away from there now, and also in the opposite direction from where the ahinas were heading. So, if they were following up on a scent, it was maybe an old kill from this guy, meaning a small kill from a day or two ago, or maybe something else, who knows what it was. But uh, not, not this, which is very lucky for him because, as I said, the biggest challenge here for Q is now that he's got this big prey, I mean, he, he's got the equivalent of a... I mean, he could eat this for five, six days and not even finish it. But uh, his big challenge will be to hopefully avoid discovery because that carcass is too big to get up into a tree for him at the moment. 
uh, he will just have to hope that vultures don't find it, because if vultures find it, then hyenas could find it. Keeping in mind, let me just think, distance-wise, not very far from you, less than a mile, I would say about a, uh, not even a kilometer, probably eight, nine hundred meters from you. So let's say a three-quarter of a mile or so away, there's a hyena den. So lots of hyena activity in that area, and I would think that if not this morning still, you never know what could happen. But certainly by this afternoon, this evening, tomorrow morning, there's going to be interesting interspecies activity around this carcass as well. So this is a, a story that we will definitely follow. But what a great way to get into it. What a great way to discover this. Starting with the guys on foot, right on ground level, right there where you can feel and smell and touch and even feel in your heartbeat itself what's going on around you. Just gonna reposition slightly. While this guy is taking a bit of a nap and you can see breathing not that fast but relatively fast because the belly is a bit fuller now we know that he was had a good eat already so the belly is fuller meaning it pushes up against the diaphragm meaning he can't take as deep breaths as he might have otherwise so that's why he's breathing a bit fast having a nice little nap as well because he's going to feed again later he wants to make the most of this meal while it's his I was just thinking again, I've, I've experienced this almost in a nostalgic way a number of times over the last few days. And I've been sitting with Leopard and I just remind myself, not that one ever forgets, but I've just been reminding myself of how absolutely amazing it is to sit like this. We are six, eight yards away from a beautiful male Leopard. He's totally unperturbed by us. We're seeing natural behavior. I have to pinch myself every now and again and just remember again that this is amazing. What we're experiencing right at this moment, potentially on these drives, is just phenomenal. Folks, we just uh, left those zebra because they walked into the vegetation. We went around a little bit further, saw some nice impala and so on, but uh, I wanted to stick with Pete because Pete is with quarantine. How fantastic is that to finish off this morning's drive with that beautiful, beautiful cat, Q. Um, I, that is my favorite, favorite leopard on, uh, in this area. I just want to come back and uh, say hi and say bye. It's been a really nice drive this morning. Elephant to start off, uh, really beautiful. Just to see that that hyena as well going up that track. That was a beautiful shot uh, Andrew did there. I really enjoyed watching that hyena walk off into the distance. And then a little bit of a, go, a walk through Buffalo uh, Dam. <coughs> it was really good. I enjoyed it this morning. Lots of lovely uh, colours and and senses uh, that we went through bit of zebra action going on which is great because I haven't seen zebra since I've been back and always great to see so, so uh, a really nice morning Zebras 
when they walk off the road, uh, we don't normally follow planes, game, or animals like that. Uh, onto, I might just take this little road down here. It's quite a nice little road, one of my less trodden paths. So we just let them go off into the uh, into the into the vegetation. But they're a beautiful creature, and uh, the Birchels or Plain Zebra is the one that we were with then, with that shadow stripe, as we said. Many of you know lots of this information, but as I say, I always say the simple stuff up front, because you never know uh, who's just joined us. If it's our first safari for some people, it's great to get all that information back out. Uh, just remind us of uh, some of the, the simple sort of facts about the animals as well. question from Sherry in Colorado. Sherry, great to have you with us and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, your question, do male zebras uh, spend their time in solitary situations or do they hang out in bachelor groups or uh, what's their sort of behaviour when they're not in mating season? Well, Sherry, the, um, the interesting thing is that all of the above, uh, really, I've seen them solitary. Uh, you just see one animal walking through the bush. Um, they are quite territorial uh, in their herds when it is mating season, but you do often see bachelor herds as well, particularly in mating season. Uh, so they really do have a bit of a, quite a, a complex social structure. Lots and lots of uh, gesturing and uh, body shaped and, and facial movements, particularly facial movements. Like most people, anyone that, out there that works with horses will know that uh, you can really tell a horse's temperament from it. That's, uh, it's how it's holding its posture and uh, how it's moving its facial features and ears, etc. So same with zebra, uh, lots of lip movement and but particularly the males, uh, they will fight ferociously in mating season, but I've seen them in all different situations, Sherry. Uh, solitary, which is obviously a little bit less uh, favorable for survival, uh, in a bachelor group and uh, in mixed herds outside of breeding season. So thank you, Sherry, for being with us this morning and a great question. So we're just arriving up on the in the quarantine area now and I think I'm just going to give you a, a final farewell uh, just to say thank you very very much for being with us I'll just pull onto this road here thanks so much for being with us um, it's been great to have you this morning uh, I'm going to hand back over to Peter but we're going to be out this afternoon for our sunrise drive here on Wild Safari Live it's been fantastic to be with you we'll see you just now up maybe. Well guys welcome back just for the last part of the drive. Beautiful view here of a mostly semi-sleepy leopard. He's got a full belly. If you've maybe just managed to join us for the last minute or two of the drive we would have a fantastic morning. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah that's what predators do well when their bellies are full. Stunning morning. A little bit cool to start with, at Ahina, a couple of illies, lots of things happening, but I really think the highlight for this morning was, uh, again, as I said earlier, on different levels even, but we've started with the walk again, so that in itself is exciting, it's such a special way to experience the bush, and um, Stefan and Scott, they managed to track down and find this amazing leopard, and not only that, he's got a kill close by, a very impressive kill at that, the size of it, he's caught a a young adult kudu female, so I'm guessing at around, as I said earlier, 120 plus kilograms, maybe even as much as 160, so very close to at least two times, or probably closer to three times the body weight of this leopard. Oh, actually, maybe even more, I'm trying to guess. He's probably not weighing much more than 45, 50 kilograms at the moment. Yeah, so I'd, I'd say probably three times his weight. 
It's a very impressive hunt. Now, I know it's been talked about in, in the Twitter feeds as well. Guys, what's going to happen with this kill is open to anyone's guess, but I would certainly think that the Ahina clan in this area, keeping in mind we've got a clan of Ahinas that live in this area, they've got their den, they've got their offspring, their babies in this area. They have to find lots of food because of that. They have to be aware of other predators in the area because of that. So that's a big dynamic in this area at the moment. So if I had to venture a guess, I would hope for this leopard's sake that nothing discovers this carcass. But it is in the open. There's not much cover around, even as much as bushes goes, never mind a tree. So I'm, I would think that during the day it's not impossible that vultures will spot this. This will be the first guys to, to uh, sort of zone in on this. And if vultures find it, from that might follow that... Uh, um, you might find, sorry, I just think I just saw a snake. I don't know, it was quick. Um, either way, if the vultures find it, that might then lead to other predators finding it. Very good possibility that this guy's brother is in the area, Kunyuma. That would be fascinating if he was to join here. Not impossible. Very possible that the Ahina clan in the area might find it. That would be not traumatic or dramatic or catastrophic or anything like that. But it would influence, obviously, big time what's going on here because Q might lose his kill then. I heard a lion roaring this morning in this direction. There should be lions somewhere in the area, also a possibility. So, so many things that can happen during the course of the day. And uh, possibly in the course of the day, but likely late afternoon. That's when things get active. That's when scents and smells travel well. So, um, as you might guess, we will certainly be spending time this afternoon with this beautiful leopard and this whole story. Seeing what happens with the kill, seeing what else comes in here. Is it maybe another leopard? Is it maybe another predator? There was a little group of buffalo around earlier as well, so so much to look forward to. And of course, having the guys on foot out there, you never know what can happen. What they might find, what they might find in the vehicle. So, um, before I talk my tongue into a, into a twister there, it's been a brilliant morning. As always, guys, let me just sit this way around. My, my seat here. It's been a brilliant morning and, um, you know, left it like that, can't ask for more. Knowing he's going to be here this afternoon, almost certainly, can't guarantee it, there's a carcass right there, lots of excitement ahead of us. From myself, Peter Pretorius, Brian, always nice to be in the vehicle with you, and all of us here down in Juma. Thanks for joining us, we will see you for another live safari this afternoon. Bye-bye.